Hey, welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to the Botanic Bioplastics Investor Q&A session. My name is Marty from Virtual and we're really excited to be hosting you tonight. I'm just going to uh, give it about another uh, 30 seconds to allow some people to join. Uh, while I'm doing that, a little bit of housekeeping as well from my end. So um, what I'm going to do is just go through the structure of the webinar tonight. Uh, essentially for the first five to 10 minutes, there's going to be a bit of introduction from Virtual and what is equity crowdfunding. Um, we've got a few uh, frequently asked questions that we'll jump into to, to fill you in on about us and about how this whole investment process works. Uh, then we'll pass over to Kerry Steins from Botanic Bioplastics to deliver an investor presentation to fill you in a bit more detail about this exciting opportunity. Uh, and then there'll be plenty of time at the end for questions and answers because that's why we're here tonight. Um, so without further ado, I think I'll just pass to Kerry really quickly for a bit of an introduction and then uh, back to me for um, for the part from virtual. Over to you, Kerry. Thanks, Martin. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Kerry Steins, the CEO of Botanic Bioplastics, um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm um, happy you're taking, or I'm delighted you're taking the time in the evening to uh, to listen to the presentation. Uh, to get a better understanding of crowdfunding on the one hand and botanic bioplastics on the other. Uh, and as Martin said, um, I'll run through a, a sort of brief presentation, 10 to 15 minutes, and then um, leave it open for questions and, and feel free to ask any question, any questions that you want, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Thanks Kerry. And uh, yeah, just on questions, you'll see down the bottom of the uh, panel here tonight, there is a Q&A button. Um, so that's where you ask, ask your questions. Uh, you also have the opportunity to upvote a question if you want that answered. And what we'll do, we'll go through the questions in order of the most upvotes. So if there's a little thumbs up next to it. Uh, that means it's received an upvote. Uh, and please feel free to ask questions at any time throughout the presentation or throughout the, the, the process that I'm going through. Um, and we'll get to them as soon as we can because we want to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, now that I see we've got a few more participants joining, I'll kick us off with an acknowledgement to country. So virtual is beaming in from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we want to uh, pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, what I'll do now is give you a little bit of an overview about virtual and what is equity crowdfunding uh, to kick us off, because I know there's a lot of people on the call who might be new to, to equity crowdfunding. Um, so I've got a little bit of a presentation here just to, to share first to start off with. Um, so equity crowdfunding, uh, you might not have heard about it, but it is a um, growing uh, way for, for startups and, and, and new businesses to raise uh, money in Australia. The laws have been in since 2018 and uh, Virtual is the largest platform in Australia by funding volume. We have more than 70% of the market share. Uh, we've done more than 200 deals and we have more than 200,000 members. What's different about equity crowdfunding is it allows uh, a, a large group of investors to invest in early stage companies. So usually if you uh, were to invest in a company like Botanic Bioplastics, there's limits to the amount of shareholders they can have. Um, for most private companies, that's 50 shareholders that are non-employees. Uh, what that means is for these companies that they usually have to raise money from, from high net worth investors in large chunks. With equity crowdfunding, the laws allow these companies to have unlimited shareholders when they come through this uh, regulated process. Uh, and what that means is uh, for people like you, uh, early stage investors, you get access to these deals. And uh, for companies, it's a new way to raise capital and, and not just raise capital, but also have um, the opportunity to engage with a large group of investors and, and, and uh, take them on that journey. So um, we were one of the first platforms to receive a license uh, back in 2018. This whole industry is regulated by ASIC, which is the same industry that uh, regulates the ASX. So our role at Virtual is not just to uh, host the uh, investments through our platform, but also to make sure that the investments we put out there are uh, meeting all the rules and regulations set out by ASIC. So uh, we see our role as the gatekeeper and, and we make sure that we uh, dot the I's and cross the, the T's from that perspective. Um, and we'll cover that in more detail tonight. But I think the key takeaways here is uh, we've done this a lot of times before, more than 200 deals, um, and it's a highly regulated industry um, for investors. Bit of a disclaimer um, before I jump in to some frequently asked questions. So we're working with Botanic Bioplastics on this uh, crowdsource funding offer. Um, so virtual financial services is the license intermediary for this offer, um, which is what I was saying before about uh, the gatekeeper process. Uh, the information and discussion in this webinar is for informational purposes only and should be not, not 
be considered uh, advice or recommendation to invest. Please do your own research and always consider the offer document and general CSF risk warning before investing, which is available on virtual. And we'll jump into that in more detail later on about what that all means. Um, a few frequently asked questions here about, uh, about us and investing through virtual, which I'll just cover now really quickly. So um, you, might have, you might hear throughout this webinar and you might hear throughout uh, this whole process um, terms such as EOI or expression of interest and then investment offer. So at the moment for Botanic Bioplastics, we're in what we call the expression of interest phase, which is the first phase of their campaign where uh, we're essentially inviting people to um, express interest, to, to um, provide their contact details as potential investors. Um, so what's happening here is we're, we're building a list of people who are interested in this opportunity um, and then you get to learn more. So by signing up, you get access to you know, information such as this webinar. You'd probably be receiving emails from the Botanic Bioplastics team. Um, and there's a lot of other perks for, for signing up early, including advanced payment terms, which basically means that um, if you invest uh, early on in the campaign, you don't have to pay for your shares uh, until the very end. So um, for some campaigns, that's a two-week process. So if you uh, invest at the start, there's no payment required. The main reason for signing up early, though, is you get exclusive access to this investment opportunity for the first uh, two days, usually. So this is what we call the early access period. So when this uh, opportunity launches next week, for everyone on the EOI list, uh, the opportunity is exclusive to you for the first few days. And anyone else who hasn't signed up, they won't be able to see that. So there's a lot of perks about signing up early. Um, and I hope everyone here tonight has signed up. And if you haven't, please just head over to the virtual website and uh, find Botanic Bioplastics so you can sign up early so you don't miss out. Um, now, investing through virtual, what is the process and what we need to provide? So if you haven't invested on, through virtual before, it's a very simple process. It's all handled uh, through our website. The main things to consider is that you'll need payment details. Um, there's a few different options for making payment, including BPay, direct debit, uh, but you will need your bank details for, for that. Uh, and then also you'll need a form of identification. So usually a driver's license is the, the best way and the easiest way to do that. But we do need to identify who you are if you're making an investment through virtual. So next week, when you're ready to invest, uh, just keep that in mind before you uh, jump on the platform. Uh, I did touch on this before, but in terms of payments, so there's a couple of different uh, payment terms. Like I said, if you get in early and then you're on the EOI list, you get that advanced payment terms, which means you don't have to actually make payment until the end of the campaign. Um, so if that runs its course, it could be two weeks. But um, the, other option, uh, the other option is that the, the campaign maxes out, hits its max target early. Um, in that case, you will uh, make payment before the end of the two weeks, but just keep that in mind. Uh, if you uh, don't uh, invest straight away, we, we still give you seven days payment terms. That means you get to put in your details, but we don't actually ask for the, the money until seven days later. So um, just keep that in mind. You don't need to have the money straight away um, and we'll be in uh, communications with you after you, uh, you make your investment application to, to follow up for payment. Um, so in terms of getting your share certificate, um, now this process happens after the campaign and the Botanic Bioplastics team will be all over this. So how it works is that we're collecting the funds, um, we, we hold them in escrow until the uh, campaign ends. Um, the reason we're doing that is because there's a few um, legal implications. We need to make sure that this uh, investment campaign hits a minimum target at least. Um, before we can release funds. So we hold the funds for you. And then after the campaign, what we do is we uh, go to the Botanic Bioplastics team with a list of investors who have made payment. And then they go ahead and issue the shares. Usually that's using a share registry provider where they'll be able to um, put your details in there. And then the share registry provider will be in contact with you with your share certificate. And then that's how you can manage all the administrative side, side of having your shares after the campaign is closed. So uh, for most uh, investors, what that means is about two weeks after the campaign closes, you'll receive your share certificate. Um, another question here about, can I cancel my investment once I make an application? So every investor, one of the uh, elements of the uh, rules set up by ASIC is a five-day cooling off period. So uh, if for whatever reason during that uh, five-day cooling off period, you decide to cancel your investment, it's very simple. Just go on the platform. There's a button there to cancel the investment and uh, we just uh, withdraw the application. And there's usually no money that has exchanged hands. So there's nothing that needs to be done there. Um, if there's any other questions or if you need to cancel at a later date or any other questions throughout the campaign, we have a support team that you can message about anything like that. Um, but just keep in mind, there's a five-day cooling off period as well after you make your application. Uh, I guess a question we get a lot of the time is about self-managed super funds or investing as a company. So the answer is 
Uh, the short answer is yes. It does depend though on the, the um, rules set out in your self-managed super fund and the, who is the trustee administering it. So uh, definitely follow that up with your accountant or whoever does that for you. But um, we do have some helpful resources on our website that uh, the Botanic Biopi 16 will send uh, usually before the investment offer goes live about investing as a self-managed super fund. And if not, you can just go on our help center and, and get the details there. Uh, so last question for me before I uh, throw back to Kerry to crack on with uh, the Botanic Bioplastics presentation is about investing more than $10,000. So it's important to keep in mind that uh, part of the rules um, for equity crowdfunding is that um, you have to have what's called a wholesale uh, shareholder certificate to invest more than $10,000. Um, this is something that your account can provide you. Um, what you need to, to have um, to be able to, to get that certificate is either more than $250,000 a year in salary for the last two years or more than $2.5 million in assets under management. So if your accountant can verify either of those, uh, then you can get this wholesale shareholder certificate and then you can invest more than $10,000 in this opportunity. Um, so what you'll have to do when you do your investment application, you just upload that certificate, our team checks it. Once we verify it, we can go ahead and proceed. For anyone else, the limit is $10,000. That means you can invest $10,000 or less in this opportunity. Um, and if you don't have that certificate, there's unfortunately no way around that. Um, and that's just part of the rules and regulations. But yeah, we can have um, a few more um, pieces of information about that if you want it. Uh, that was all the uh, details I wanted to cover from a virtual uh, perspective. And uh, if there's any questions about that, please feel free to pop them in the Q&A panel. What I'll do now is stop sharing my screen and uh, hand over to Kerry to crack on with the Botanic Bioplastics presentation. You've got to help me share my screen. Yes. So uh, there you go. You can go ahead and share that now, Kerry. Uh, and just while you're doing that, uh, I had a question come through asking about will the presentation be available after? Uh, yes, it definitely will be. <laughs> so don't worry about taking notes uh, if that's what you're worried about there. And it's um, it's it's being recorded as well. So after you'll have a copy of the uh, recording as well. So um, that'll be sent out usually a day after. Um, I just wanted to to cover that for everyone else. But thanks for those questions. Uh, now, can you see the sharing screen share? Yeah, we can. I think if you want to just hit that slideshow view like we did last time, Kerry, that will be this way to do it. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Okay. Um, well, welcome, everybody, again. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll keep it relatively brief um, so, that, uh, so that there's plenty of time for questions, and I'm sure there, there are a range of questions on, on hemp on the one hand, um, bioplastics on the other. Uh, and how we bring those two things together. Um, there's a little bit of history to this business. Um, Botanic Bioplastics was born out of uh, its parent company, Botanic Wellness. Botanic Wellness is a company that grows hemp, um, process or grows hemp, um, harvests the hemp, processes the hemp uh, for its CBD content. And you'll be familiar, or some of you will be familiar with uh, uh, what you can do with CBD uh, for nutraceutical medicinal purposes. So essentially, um, Botanic Wellness will um, grow the crop, post-process the crop, extract the CBD, and then that's where bio Botanic Bioplastics come in. Um, out of that, there is a significant amount of um, a significant amount of, of, if you like, hemp waste um, or, or uh, waste biomass left over. Uh, and to give you an idea, the company um, in any given year will will process or harvest around about will grow and harvest around about 2000 acres between the US uh, and Australia. Um, it will after it's extracted the CBD, there's obviously a significant amount of um, of uh, of biomass that can then be processed for the purposes of creating um, bioplastics. And in this case, particularly bioplastics um, with a significant component of hemp. Um, I'll just run through very briefly uh, an executive summary, the business, uh, various advantages of hemp, uh, the hemp farming process, just to give you a bit of background, uh, the hemp bioplastic business itself, um, the team that is uh, is operating the botanic bioplastic business, uh, and some of the arguments or reasons why you might want to invest in the company. Um, as I said, botanic bioplastics is 90% is owned subsidiary of an unlisted public company, Botanic Wellness Limited, uh, established in mid-2022 to focus on, as I say, the use of the waste 
um, biomass material that was left over after the crops had been processed. And that's, as I said, a significant amount of, uh, of biomass. Probably to put it into perspective, as I say, 3,000 tonnes uh, in, in the US, about 1,500 tonnes in Australia. Um, we're talking a couple of hundred semi-trailers of material, just to put it into, into very simple terms. Um, the company has been operating, uh, as I say, since mid-2022 um, and uh, has access to all of the biomass that's left over from the processing um, and, and any new biomass or the new biomass that will be grown in the US and Australia um, over the coming years. Uh, that material is provided to Botanic Bioplastics for free, uh, no cost, um, for the purposes of creating the bioplastics. Um, and as you can see there, uh, we possess a significant amount of CBD hemp biomass, uh, 3,000 tonnes in the USA, 1,500 tonnes in Australia. Uh, the biomass is processed originally for the CBD, and then, as I say, we have the leftover waste material. And this is this is the beauty of this business. The waste material um, is the most expensive comp input component, uh, but we get it for no cost. So it's, in fact, not dissimilar from how original plastic was developed. Original plastic, if you don't know, was um, created from... Uh, petroleum waste products. So after petroleum had been processed, there was waste material and that was turned into plastic. Um, now, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, plastic is an incredibly uh, versatile, functional, um, effective um, product and has been for the last hundred years and one of the most now one of the most used products on the planet. Unfortunately, um, that product, while good from a functional perspective, a price perspective and every other perspective, um, it is very damaging to the environment and it doesn't biodegrade. So what's more recently happened is companies, uh, a range of companies, including ourselves, have looked at how to create effectively the uh, raw material input uh, to create uh, bioplastics. And in this case, uh, and in the case of others using corn and uh, other products, uh, it's using agricultural waste to create effectively um, the same sort of products and the same sort of business. Um, as you can see uh, from the third point there, we received the, 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 uh, the waste hemp biomass at no cost. Uh, we dry the material uh, in large dryers, which I'll show you in a moment. It's then processed, um, hemp, what they call hammer mill, so um, pounded into powder, and then mixed with, with hemp-based resins to form the uh, bioplastic input material. Um, and that's then, uh, and again, again, I'll show you this in a moment, it's then created, uh, turned into little pellets. Uh, which are um, molded um, in a similar way to traditional plastics. Um, so when you, uh, you, you, you've you processed the material, you dry it in that uh, big blue drying machine you can see on the bottom right-hand corner, um, that uh, dries the material. It's then, uh, as I say, hammer milled into uh, 50 micron particles, which is very much like dust. Um, and then it's molded with the resin into little pellets that actually look like, funnily enough, a bit like seeds. Um, that material is then um, molded in a couple of different ways, either injection molding, which is where it's um, sent into a mold um, at high pressure and high temperature. Um, the mold will consist of a number of dyes, so in other words, or cavities. So the cavities will sit there, um, the mold, the, the, the resin will go in, at high temperature under extreme pressure. Um, and within 30 seconds, uh, hardens, is cooled and molds. And then the, the molds come apart and the product then falls into whatever uh, packaging material below. So either it might fall into a box or normally it falls on a conveyor belt um, so that it can, it, can, um, it can be turned into, it can be put into packaging or whatever else. Um, you can see there um, some of the, so that's the, 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 the the, the resin I was talking about. So the resin is pelletized and that, that those pellets are then put into, um, into the molds and then they turn into the, into the product. Um, now, some of the advantages of hemp, which is, is the particularly probably important part of this whole story. Um, first of all, we have a lot of material that we've obtained for free because it's waste material. Um, hemp itself is a very environmentally friendly product. Um, it grows in 90 to 120, 100, sort of 90 to 110 days, 100 to 110 days. Um, it uh, it's uses very little water. It uses relatively few pesticides or no pesticides. Um, it uses, as I say, less water than most other products. And it sequesters or captures three times of the carbon 
uh, of traditional uh, wood or trees. Um, that means it's a, it's a very environmentally, environmentally friendly product to grow. Uh, as I say, less water, less pesticides um, and fast growing. Um, once it's harvested, which is relatively simply done with traditional farming equipment, um, as I say, it's then uh, uh, dried, uh, pelletized, turned into a resin and made into product. Um, now, in terms of hemp, uh, one of the reasons that, uh, and it's depending on how much any of you know about hemp, um, obviously hemp's got a very long history. Um, in, in principle, they say it's, it was uh, developed in China 8,000 years ago. Um, it's got a rather checkered history in the last 100 years because hemp was bundled in with uh, with cannabis or marijuana um, and therefore made illegal. And it was only until relatively recently um, that, well, sorry, until relatively recently, it wasn't able to be grown. Uh, it was a prohibited product. Um, that has changed with the US Farm Act in 2018. Uh, it's also able to be grown in Australia. So we have, as I say, farms across the US and we have farms across a farm in, in New South Wales and Australia. Um, and we're able to legally grow um, the, uh, as much product essentially um, as we need for the servicing of these products. Um, when hemp is, um, is used in bioplastic products, um, it's incredibly functional. It's for all intents and purposes. Uh, and I can actually um, show you some products that created out of hemp um, here, which uh, are some of the products um, that we can create, uh, cutlery, uh, straws, um, we have food packaging, uh, we have uh, what you would, I guess, imagine as a McDonald's case uh, or for takeaway food. Um, it's for all intents and purposes, very similar to, um, and all has all the uh, similar features to traditional plastic. It's functional, it's flexible, it's strong. Uh, in fact, uh, in some respect, it's stronger than traditional plastic. It's moldable. Um, and because we're producing it or receiving the material at, at no cost, we can produce at a similar price to what traditional plastics can be produced at. Um, these are some, again, some of the advantages of hemp, 90 to 110 days to grow, naturally produced, an affordable alternative. Uh, one of the uh, unique characteristics of, of, um, uh, of hemp is it has about 65 to 70% cellulose, which is the material that, um, which is the material that helps to bind. Uh, that's compared with about 40% in trees. The only agricultural product that has a uh, higher cellulose content than hemp is actually cotton, but there are problems with cotton in terms of the, the pesticides and other ways it's produced. Um, as I've said there, the growing of hemp is far more environmentally friendly when, grown, when, when compared to similar crops. It grows faster, less water, few pesticides, sequesters three times as much as trees. Um, it also captures carbon dioxide uh, and turns it into oxygen. Uh, and as you can see, there's some statistics estimated for every one tonne of hemp produced, 1.63 tonnes of carbon is removed from the air. So the product we're producing it's on its construction uh, or its growing um, is, uh, is, as I say, um, very environmentally friendly. Uh, the other byproduct, uh, which is why it's been very attractive for farmers to grow, is that it actually, uh, farmers obviously rotate their crops. Hemp actually improves the soil, um, uh, the soil, of, uh, soil in the crops. Uh, or the, sorry, the soil um, for the growing of future crops. Um, one sort of uh, little bit of information is when uh, uh, when there was the disaster at Chernobyl, um, the first thing that uh, that um, was done after Chernobyl was that they planted and have continued to plant multiple hemp crops uh, to drag the um, the toxins out of the soil. What actually happens with a hemp plant is that um, however high it grows and it can grow to 10, 12, 14 foot high in about that 100 days, uh, is that the taproot um, goes down about as far as the plant goes up. So it goes down very deep. Um, it uh, therefore can find water pretty easily, which is why it doesn't require much water. And it also, as I say, then cleans the soil. Um, the difference between biodegradable plastics and uh, or hemp and, and biodegradable plastics generally um, is that they do biodegrade, whereas obviously fuel, uh, fossil fuel-based, um, petroleum-based plastics, which we're used to using, um, uh, arguably don't decompose for 500 years. And from what we've been told and, and studied, uh, in fact, every piece of petroleum-based plastic that's ever been invented is actually still in existence. Uh, and it's actually worse than that. Not only does it um, not decompose, but it actually breaks down into what they call microplastics. Uh, and that means that it's, it is, it's easier um, absorbed into the soil or sorry, stays in the soil and goes into waterways and other things as microplastics is all then also then consumed by humans, animals, 
and everything else. And, and that's uh, creating a significant uh, ecological uh, problem going forward. Um, I've covered in there, and this presentation will be available to anyone who wants it, and I will send it out uh, with a, a, the recording of this um, presentation in a couple of days. Um, so you can see in more details, and by, by all means, uh, if you've got any questions in relation to any of the matters raised here, um, by all means, um, I'm happy to have a chat to you about them, or someone on my team um, equally could call you. Um, the evolution, or if you like, or the, 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 the more recent evolution of, of bioplastics has really been brought on by an increasing increasing awareness of all the ESG issues, um, particularly obviously saving the planet, reducing um, uh, traditional petroleum-based plastics, uh, encouraging recycling, um, encouraging plants uh, products to be made out of biodegradable materials, uh, and this 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 goes across uh, every sector from solar panels to wind farming to everything else. The idea is to um, obviously uh, reduce the damage that's being done to the planet uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, and the only way to do that is either recycle more or biodegrade more and use products that are, in, are environmentally friendly. Um, now, some of the advantages of hemp bioplastics relative to other products, um, our products uh, that I showed you a moment ago, they don't dis dis disintegrate in hot or cold water. Uh, they don't leave any unpleasant taste. They're very similar to plastics. Uh, they they're biodegradable, break down over a, a number of months. Um, uh, in the case of uh, some of the products as, as, as quickly as 30 to 60 days, in the case of some others, uh, six to 12 months. Uh, and that's an evolving process. We're working with our partners in the US uh, to develop better and better products um, and more biodegradable products that biodegrade faster uh, and can be used for a variety of different purposes. And those purposes are, they, they have to cover things like strength, uh, UV protection, um, uh, not obviously not um, um, you're gonna break down in, um, in water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, that then that's an ongoing process, which not only we are undertaking, but a lot of other companies, uh, no doubt, around the world are undertaking at the same time. Fortunately, in in one sense, it is quite fortunate. Australia is a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, we do a lot of business in the US. Um, in the US is probably, whereas in most things, I guess they're a couple of years ahead of us in uh, in this sort of um, ESG area and the uh, the getting rid of a variety of plastics and the replacement with bioplastics. They're a little bit behind. Um, so it gives us a good opportunity to be ahead of the pack here. Uh, and then when uh, when we've perfected some of these products here and expanded our product range to um, export those products, um, particularly in, in particularly to Southeast Asia. Um, to give you a very quick uh, sort of pictorial version, um, you can see the first slide there is the planting process. Uh, the seeds are in those yellow boxes. Um, we plant a significant amount of seeds per acre, um, probably around about 100,000 seeds per acre. You can see uh, the early growth in week four, uh, which is the plants at an early stage. Uh, late growth, uh, week 12, um, where they're quite... Uh, now, those plants can grow anything from sort of uh, up to about six feet up to about 12 to 14 feet. Um, and uh, and obviously, the higher they grow and the more bushy they are, the more um, stalks, stems and leaves there are to create the bioplastic material. Harvesting, you can see in week 16, um, you can see the plants have gone brown. So when they go from green to brown, that means they're ready to harvest. Uh, we harvest um, and then we put it into open top semi trailers. Uh, it's then baled. Um, it's taken for extraction, uh, which you can see there. Uh, after extraction, it then goes to the uh, hemp fiber drying machine. That's a very large um, dryer um, that uh, can dry the material. Uh, from there, it's mixed with the resin and creates those hemp pellets. You can see on the bottom left hand corner, and from there, it can go into a range. It goes into a range of, uh, of products. And that product range is uh, is expanding almost on a monthly basis, not only by us, but but by various other companies around the world. Um, in terms of the team behind the uh, uh, behind the company, um, very briefly on myself, um, I'm a ex well, an ex lawyer. Um, I'm a reformed lawyer. Uh, I was a lawyer with Minter Ellison, um, a large commercial law firm um, in uh, in and uh, M and A, uh, and working with startups, uh, and then established my own practice. Um, uh, and have been operating that practice for around about 30 years. Um, I floated around eight to 10 companies on the stock exchange. Um, and, uh, and that's certainly the plan for botanic bioplastics. Um, the companies there may or may not fam be familiar with you, to you. I've run media companies, uh, infrastructure, mining, um, uh, technology, uh, resources, as I say, um, over, the, over a number of years. Uh, I'm still currently practicing certificate. Uh, uh, current practicing certificate, so I'm still a practicing lawyer, uh, but I essentially only practice for the purpose of uh, of the company that uh, that we're talking about today. Um, 
Graham McDonald, um, a very experienced farmer, uh, been in the industry for 30 years, third generation farming family. Um, they have a farm that we use in New South Wales. Um, uh, they are, they've got around about 12,000 acres. Uh, we've got a license to grow up to 1,000 uh, hectares, which is about 2,500 acres. Um, and he is also responsible for um, the processing of the equipment, uh, processing of material from the um, the hemp biomass um, through to the material that is mixed with the resin, which then goes to make the bioplastics. Um, uh, a very experienced farmer, um, a great guy to have on board. Um, and uh, he and I now work together for a couple of years um, on this project, which is uh, which has been um, uh, hopefully enjoyable for him, but certainly um, very enjoyable for me. Um, Yas Torfik, uh, again, um, has a background in business. Um, he uh, has extensive contacts in a variety of countries uh, and does a lot of import export business uh, and is heading up the sales division um, and supervising the sales team. Um, we also have access to uh, a couple of other executives um, from the company's parent head office operation in the US. Uh, Joe Wicker, who advises on um, the bioplastic products uh, from a US perspective, giving us an insight uh, into uh, what's possible in Australia. Uh, Stuart Parry, who I've known for over 30 years. Um, he, and, he and I, in fact, went to school together. Um, he's been in the plastics industry for around about 30 years in the traditional plastics industry um, and has been looking at bioplastics and materials um, uh, in the bioplastic area for the last five to 10 years. Um, and he's working with us to, uh, to develop the business. Um, Jason Aran, again, a, one of our US executives um, who assists the company with um, the processing of the material in the US from the hemp through to the uh, material for the biomass. Uh, and Nicholas Sonnenson, who is my assistant here, who uh, uh, is again a lawyer, um, looks after our regulatory issues uh, insofar as there, uh, as there are any, um, organises the licenses and permits, um, and also handles our media marketing and social media um, uh, aspects of the business. Um, very quickly, um, I guess, talk about the, the, the reasons for the business. Um, an investment in bio, botanic bioplastics obviously provides early stage exposure to very exciting and rapidly growing bioplastics market, uh, both here and in Southeast Asia. Uh, the relationship we have with the parent company, Botanic Wellness, gives us access to around about 4,000 tonnes of existing material, which would be, uh, which would be quite, uh, well, sorry, is quite valuable. Uh, it's around about fifteen hundred acres, fifteen hundred dollars per acre to grow, uh, and as I say, at any given time, we're probably growing uh, around about two thousand two thousand acres per year, uh, and have about two years of material um, backed up. And that material, as I said, is provided to the company at no cost. Uh, we take that excess waste material um, again, as I say, at no cost to produce the uh, the bioplastics, uh, which is the base material required. Um, we then uh, process that into the range of products. Uh, we obviously plan to significantly expand the business. I think the growth, um, and I'm sure you, a lot of you will be aware, uh, the growth of uh, ESG on the one hand, environmentally friendly, sustainable products to replace environmentally unfriendly, harmful products um, is only now really starting to, to gather pace. Uh, there's all sorts of um, uh, conventions and rules and um, treaties being entered into to reduce uh, the use of plastic all around the world. Um, and uh, and that is only going to gather pace um, to try and meet various government um, and regulatory, um, I guess arbitrary, but government and regulatory uh, mandates and limits um, in the years going forward. Um, as I said above, the company has a, a very experienced management team, uh, both in the um, development, creation, expansion of startups and uh, and I suppose later later term companies, and then also particularly in relation to myself, um, the listing of those companies on the stock exchange which is certainly the plan for this company uh, in the not too distant future. Um, Martin, I think I'll, uh, I'll leave it there. If anyone's got any particular questions, uh, please uh, feel free. I'm very keen to answer them. Thanks for that, Kerry. Um, and we do have a fair few questions that have come through um, so far. I'll just give everyone a reminder that we have to do questions through the Q&A panel. So I see, uh, Greg, you've got your hand raised. Uh, please just pop your question in that Q&A uh, panel below so we can get to it. Um, Kerry, you might just want to, yeah, there you go. Stop sharing your screen. Um, and then we, uh, it will just be that red button at the top middle and then we'll, um, be able to see both of our screens clearly. There we go. 
Um, so yeah, we'll jump into questions and I did uh, try and get to as many as I could answer with links to the uh, help articles that I mentioned. Um, I'll just uh, make sure that everyone is aware that there is a help center at virtual. It's uh, help.virtual.com. Um, so yeah, for, for, for any uh, other questions, particularly for, from our platform perspective, just go there. Uh, all right, let's crack on with these questions now. So a question here from Bryce is asking, uh, what sort of marketing are you pushing towards? Um, I guess this is, you know, obviously for, for selling the products that we've mentioned there, Kerry, um, and how strong is that strategy? Well, it is, it's a good question. Um, there's a range of products, but I think it, it's important to understand the, the size of the industry. Uh, basically, plastic is, a traditional plastic is, one of the most used products in the world and has been for the last 100 years. Funnily enough, um, plastic was introduced as an environmental um, exercise, supposedly, 100 years ago to, um, to save uh, the use of um, ceramics, glass, um, tortoiseshells, um, elephant tusks and everything else as a, an effective form of storage and transport of food um, in particular. Um, and it still serves that purpose incredibly well. Uh, in fact, plastic is fantastic, um, except for its environmental impact. Um, so in terms of the range of products, uh, and it depends on the jurisdiction and it depends on the customer, uh, we can produce a range of single use plastics. Um, so knives, forks, spoons, straws, that sort of stuff, food packaging, the sort of stuff that I showed you here, um, we can produce that in and, and sell that into jurisdictions where that's permissible. Um, but we can also produce uh, and are in discussions with a variety of companies for infrastructure. So things like um, traffic lights uh, that you'd be familiar with in the streets, red, amber, green, the casings for traffic lights, uh, witches hats, um, uh, items that you would have seen in the presentation, uh, coat hangers, uh, clothing pegs, uh, food packaging, uh, packaging for things like shampoos, um, detergents, anything that you can think of that's currently plastic. Now, a lot of a lot of those plastic things um, have been uh, where the argument is that they're recyclable, uh, and a lot of things are recyclable, and a lot of things are recycled. The problem with recycling is that in Australia at the moment, only about eight to ten percent of plastic products are actually recycled, uh, and plastic recycling can only um, you can only recycle plastic so many times. Um, so gradually, um, the market will have to move more and more to bioplastics, because while, while as I say, while recycling is a, a very meritorious thing to do, and we should continue to do as much of it as we can, if you recycle a, a ton of plastic, that's a ton of plastic we don't need to create new. Um, but ultimately, I think the, the solution was, is going to be biodegradable. Um, and in terms of the products, uh, products we've seen, everything from uh, iPhone cases, as I said, cutlery, straws, food packaging, uh, clothing pegs, um, uh, anything you can possibly think of, a handle on your kettle, um, uh, the, the, the chair that you're sitting on, these are all made with a variety of different um, tr traditional or current, um, currently petroleum-based plastics. And those progressively have to be, um, have to be eliminated and or the use of them reduced. So yeah. whatever you can think of, um, I was talking to Martin earlier today about um, inviting um, potential um, investors uh, to make suggestions as to what you think we could produce. We've got a range of, of dyes and molds of products that we're currently producing and intend to produce, and that range is going to expand, but we're certainly interested to hear any ideas that um, that investors, uh, potential investors may have. We had yeah. an inquiry from someone this morning who's uh, has put in an EOI um, about whether we could create um, glasses, uh, frames for, um, for reading glasses and, and uh, for glasses generally, and the answer is yes, we can. So there is no real limit. If you can, if you've if you've seen it in plastic, we can make it make it in bioplastic. Yeah, yeah, that's really exciting. I guess for everyone on the call and for for investors listening later, um, in terms of you know sending your ideas through to the botanic bioplastics team, I just wanted to follow up there, Kerry, with a question about obviously there's a lot of possibilities with what you can make, almost endless possibilities with with everything that's produced with plastic today. Um, Obviously, we've seen that the cutlery, the straws, the, the food packaging. Is this what you're thinking in terms of the first products you'll get out in market uh, or any other thoughts? In terms yeah, no, that's, of the so the, the products we're producing in the US at the moment are the uh, the nice forks and spoons and the straws. Uh, so those will be the first to market in places where we're able to sell them. Um, now, there's a variety of different, it's a very, well, sorry, very regular, uh, uh, rather complex regulatory environment. Um, there's different rules in different places. And the introduction of those rules is is uh, is also 
uh, a bit of a minefield. So it's, it's probably fortunate that myself and 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 uh, my assistant are both lawyers, so we can navigate that. But the first the first products will be the ones we're currently producing: knives, forks, spoons, straws, food packaging. Um, but we've already started to look at, as I said, at the uh, the road infrastructure uh, materials. Um, we've looked at uh, a range of other materials that will um, will be the next um, rollout of additional products. It's actually relatively simple. Our, our advantage is that we have vast amounts uh, or vast quantities of available uh, hemp biomass waste. We can convert that into bioplastic, and we can convert that into products. The reason, there's no question that, that, that uh, bioplastics are not a good idea. The reason that there's been a, a sort of a constraint on growth or it's hampered growth is because the cost of the raw materials has meant that bioplastics have traditionally been more expensive than traditional plastics. And that's because traditional plastics are very cheap because the waste material, waste petroleum-based material is, is actually relatively inexpensive. Um, the difference in our case is that we focus on um, the farming and our ability to get that waste material. Uh, so we're not creating new material to create bioplastics. We're using existing waste material. And because we've got that at no cost, um, we can then make uh, large amounts of, of, of uh, bioplastic and large amounts of resin. Uh, and then all we need to do really, and we've got a, an ongoing a program about creating uh, and developing uh, new, new designs, new molds, um, and using existing plastic manufacturers to uh, to actually produce a, a wider range of products. There's really only two aspects or maybe three aspects to it. There's the resin, which we have. There's the dye or the mold, which essentially is a sort of two foot, generally speaking, a two foot by two foot solid piece of metal, steel, uh, which has cavities in it um, that then when the, when the resin is injected into the cavities and fills it out in the same way as traditional plastic does, it can then create one, two, 10, um, 20, 30, 40 versions of the same product, uh, roughly every 30 to 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, that material, that those products, when they're they're then they they um, have been molded, they then drop out, uh, and as I say, in exactly the same way. So the model the model we're adopting is not changing the way plastics have traditionally been made. We're simply changing the material from which the material is made to a more environmentally friendly material. So the sky's the limit in terms of what we can produce. And uh, thanks everyone for the questions. We've got 27 open questions now, so we'll try and get through as many as possible. Um, we have a few questions here, Kerry, just about biodegradability versus compostability. Um, you know, a question here from Kerry asking, um, is the product home compostable or only commercially compostable? Um, yeah, can you just speak to biodegradable and, and compostable? Yeah, no, no, that's a very good question. Um, and there's a, look, there's a, there's a wide range of... Um, uh, there's a wide range of answers. Uh, some of the materials we produce, some of the resins we produce are home compostable. Um, I've in fact, when, when we went back and we were doing due, due, due diligence on this, um, this opportunity going back a year, um, I used um, some of the straws, for example. Um, I put them in water for a period of 90 days, um, hot, cold, uh, water, milk, other um, liquid products. Um, and uh, they didn't degrade or, or, uh, or, or um, deteriorate at all. Uh, and then I took them and planted them in, in um, a variety of pot plants, um, which uh, were, were sort of um, normal pot plants you would have at home. Um, and the straws disappeared within about sort of 14 to 21 days. Uh, and the cutlery um, probably now is deteriorating. So it's probably six to six to nine months, nine months in. So there's a range of products that are home compostable. There will be a range of products that are industrially compostable at the moment. And we're working uh, with our partners in the US uh, and with both regulatory authorities and um, uh, the authorities that um, provide the sort of um, certifications uh, to ensure that what products we sell come with the requisite certifications. Yeah. And just a follow-up question here from Callan asking, is there any petroleum products used in the process at all? So maybe if you can speak to the resin that's used to, uh, to bind it, Kerry, that'd be good. Um, no, there's no petroleum-based products in it at all. Nice one, good to know. Um, and then a uh, question here um, from an anonymous attendee asking uh, in terms of separating the, the two companies, just the thought process behind that. So I guess you have Botanic Wellness that you mentioned earlier and now Botanic Bioplastics. Can you just speak to- Sure, to no, no, that's a very good, a very, again, very good question. Um, Botanic, Botanic Wellness was a company we, we, uh, we incorporated uh, about five years ago. Um, uh, it's got about 500 shareholders. Um, it uh, is a business that's involved in the growing of crops, 
the producing of hemp, the manufacturing of um, or the, the processing of the hemp uh, to create um, a range of CBD products. So we make tinctures and um, gummies and um, tinct uh, tinctures, gummies, what they call gel caps, which look like little fish oil tablets, uh, creams and balms and all that sort of stuff. And out of doing that for um, three or four years, five years now, um, we had this vast amount of waste material, waste hemp material. Uh, and as I said, the, the, the characteristics of, of hemp are unique. It's strong. Um, it's in some respects uh, can be can potentially can be stronger than, than steel. Um, but it's, we had vast amounts of it and we wanted to work out what we could do both to, we had, we had a variety of options at, at Botanic Wellness. We could either bury it, um, we could burn it, um, or we could pay someone to take it away or we could, or we could destroy it. Um, what we looked at going back a year and a half is how we could best utilize that waste material uh, and best use, utilize a very good waste material. Um, we looked at uh, a variety of things and you'll be familiar with, or some of you, some of you guys will be familiar with things like hempcrete, uh, so that's putting into concrete to create additional strength, uh, hemp fabrics, which is also um, a, a good a good opportunity and, and no doubt will, will be used um, increasingly in the future. Uh, but the most valuable thing we, we thought uh, and realized and worked out we could do with the material was to make it into bioplastics. First of all, because it would it's replacing some a very harmful product. Uh, and it's a, it's a product that can't really be just got rid of. It needs to be replaced. Uh, there needs to be a replacement for plastic. We can't get rid of plastic and not have an alternative. Um, and this bioplastic alternative um, is one of the better alternatives around, in part because of the strength of it, in part because of the cellulose content of the, of the plant um, and the cellulose content then of the, of the material that we're producing. Thanks for that, Kerry. Um, okay, we have a few questions here about, you know, distribution plans and, you know, a question here about, you know, are you going to go for wholesale clients exclusively to start with? Um, I think we've talked a little bit about marketing, but can you maybe talk about the the distribution and how you're going to get their products to market? Sure. Um, look, in the, in the past, um, we have been able to pitch to restaurants and that sort of stuff. And that's, uh, that's good, but it's in relatively small quantities um, and it's very labor intensive. Our intention uh, is to produce products at large scale. Uh, when I say large scale, um, you know, for people wanting um, 100,000 um, units a month or a million units a month, um, and focus on those because it's really by achieving those sort of economies of scale that we can keep the price down. Um, if we've got a lot of small boxes of 20 straws growing out or, or, or packets of cutlery, that's a relatively expensive exercise when you add in the, the, the well, not only the distribution and the marketing and, um, uh, and, and the physical distribution and the packaging and everything else. Um, what we're more interested in doing is replacing large scale uh, and, and approaching large scale um, commercial clients with a product. And our, our sales efforts to date have been focused exclusively on that. We've spoken to a number of large retailers um, in terms of both their own requirements uh, and in terms of retail as well. So we'll be doing both com large scale commercial and wholesale as well as retail and we'll be doing online uh, as well and, and you know traditional offline. Yeah, yeah, good to know. Going, going for the uh, the bigger distributions early. By the I think, time. yeah, like, I think I think the, the, the real story is um, is really the hemp story. Um, hemp is simply one of the better products to use. We've got lots of it. Uh, we can make a lot of product um, inexpensively because, as I say, we've got it for free uh, or at no cost. Um, and really, there's there's no real question that bioplastics is a good idea. As I said before, the real issue about the the introduction, the rollout, the adoption um, of bioplastics has been limited to date. In some, to some extent, by a lack of understanding, but to some extent in the case of hemp, because it's been illegal to grow until about 2018, um, and to some extent, and probably the greatest extent, because um, because it was considered and was more expensive. Um, if we've got 40, 40 to 50 percent of the input at no cost, um, and then we've just and we do it on a large enough scale, then we can produce bioplastic hemp bioplastic products at the same price or similar price to plastics. I think you mentioned, Kerry, the, uh, the amount of straws McDonald's go through dailies in the millions in Australia alone. And I think it's uh, hundreds of millions. Well, of McDonald's on its own uses about 500 million straws uh, per annum. Uh, and in the US, uh, it's around 5 billion. Um, so that's that's a very clear indication. Now, I'm not saying we could handle McDonald's in the US um, because we would need hundreds of dyes and machines going around the clock to do that. Uh, but what we what we're working on doing each of the moles um, at the moment, uh, let's say I'll go back to cutlery. Each of the moles at the moment can produce around one and a half million pieces, uh, individual pieces per month. Um, so if we want to service a client that uh, you know needs ten million pieces, um, then we would need X number of dyes producing X number 
24 um, seven. And that's what we're in the process of tooling up to do. Yeah. Good Our intention is not to sell small parcels, you know, to supermarkets for kids' birthdays. Uh, that's not the intention because that's, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's meritorious and it's good. Uh, and you know it can be sold alongside other products but our our objective is to um, develop um, products on a much larger scale much larger quantity at much lower price yeah yeah and that's going to have the biggest impact as well um got a question here about um you, you know you said you get the biomass for free um but does it need to be shipped from the usa to australia or is there a manufacturing facility in the us as well uh, well, sorry, no, that's a good question. Um, at the moment, the initial stage, at, at the moment, we're producing the materials in the US. Um, we're using the hemp in, from the US, we're using um, the resin in the US, and we're molding in the US and we'll be, and shipping to Australia. Um, the plan is uh, following this, um, in the event that this um, crowdfunding raising is successful, uh, we'll bring some of those molds and dyes to Australia. Um, and we'll start to produce the resin in Australia. And so we'd be manufacturing 100% in Australia as well. Uh, it's a bit of a stage process. Um, as I say, initially, we'll bring the, the products over so that we can uh, we can um, uh, get to, get larger sales going straight away. Um, but longer term, the intention is to do all of this in Australia. Um, and the, the, each of the markets that we, we're looking at um, are significant in size on their own. Uh, we could have 20 moles producing um, uh, as much as we could produce 24-7 uh, and we still wouldn't be go anywhere near the uh, the uh, expressions of interest we've had for from from customers, large, small, business, government, et cetera. Yeah. Um, we do have a few uh, questions still open. We actually have 24 questions still open. Uh, we, we will just go over time a little bit, I imagine. Um, so I hope that's all right with everyone. Um, but yeah, we'll try and get to as many questions as possible. Um, and thanks everyone for all your questions and for, for hanging around and giving us part of your evening to be here. Um, got a few questions about just, you know, production and upscaling production. Uh, if, is there a need to upscale production at all, Terry, at the moment, or, you know, based on your current operations, um, you know, do you have enough biomass, um, you know, more than enough biomass than you need? Oh, no, no, no. Good question. Well, that, there's actually probably two, two parts of that question. Uh, the first, the first part of the question is, do we have enough biomass? The answer is yes. Uh, so currently we have around about between the US and Australia, we had about 4,000 tonnes to process. Um, that will keep us going for easily for the next two years. Uh, we've just harvested another uh, 220 acres here at the beginning of May uh, in New South Wales. Um, and I was speaking to our team in the US, they're planting or planning to plant about 2,000 acres in the US um, in the coming season. We're actually in a very fortunate position. Uh, obviously, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere. So essentially, we're growing 12 months of the year. We in Australia plant around about September, October uh, and harvest in May. Uh, and in the US, they plant in May, June and harvest in September, October. So we have 12 months supply of product. Uh, so the product is not the issue and we can process as much and create as much resin as we need um, for our current requirements. Where we do um, where we do need to tool up, and this is the reason for this um, CSF campaign, um, is we need to buy more moles, more dyes, so that we can produce larger and larger quantities. Uh, obviously, if one dye can produce, let's say, one and a half million items, um, and we need to produce 10 million items, then we need six dyes to do that. Um, the dyes are, um, are not cheap. They're between $35,000 and $50,000 each. Um, uh, I've always found it a little bit hard to understand why, but when you see them, um, it's actually not hard to understand when you see the um, the structure, both of the metal and the moles inside. Um, they're very valuable assets. So once you've got it, you've essentially got it for all time. They don't um, they don't wear down or anything else. So the reason for doing this, uh, this uh, crowdfunding campaign is simply to buy essentially more moles and dyes uh, and to increase the amount of product that we can produce um, and therefore take on larger customers, achieve greater economies of scale, um, go to, as I say, larger commercial customers. So the, the, as I say, the only reason, um, the, the, the Botanic Bioplastics business has been funded by its parent to date. Um, and what we want to do, uh, we, we, as I say, we established a separate com company, Botanic Bioplastics, which is the company conducting the campaign. What we wanted to do was separate that out. Um, so its relationship with the head office is, is essentially just the provision of, of the hemp material uh, and some expertise along the way. Uh, and then to uh, separately list the um, the bioplastics business on the ASX um, at the earliest possible opportunity. Yeah, thanks for that, Kerry. 
Um, got a couple of questions here about competitors uh, that we can get to now. So uh, Callan here is asking, where do you see this product versus current market leaders? Uh, like who are the main uh, commercially compostable products in terms of competition? Um, look, there are a couple of companies. Um, everyone at the moment is relatively small. Um, there are no, as far as we're aware, or not, no, there are relatively few, um, if any, hemp company or companies doing hemp. Uh, and that's probably in large part because there's we're one of the larger growers of hemp in the US and in Australia um, over after after a period of sort of five years of being in the business. Um, so in terms of hemp, we have very very few competitors. In terms of other products, um, there are products, uh, similar products made out of sugarcane, uh, bamboo, um, paper, cardboard. Um, but I think you know, I'm, I'm sure you um, everyone watching today. Uh, will agree that if they've had a drink out of a paper straw, it's not a particularly rewarding experience. Um, the issue is um, which now we're, we're an advocate for all of those products. All of those products will help to reduce um, petroleum based plastics. So whether it's whatever those other products are, that's fantastic. The size of the market is um, indefinite or, or uh, um, uh, very hard to quantify at the moment. You're talking about replacing uh, one of the most used products on the planet with something that's more environmentally friendly. Um, so whether it's producing a traffic light or a, or a piece of cutlery or whatever, um, the more competitors, the better. We're not we're not competing against others. Uh, we simply um, promote the virtues of hemp, uh, which, as I say, not only do we get it for nothing or for free, but um, it has properties that some of these other products don't have. Um, it's more environmentally. There's really three stages. It's it, hemp's more environmentally friendly to grow in terms of uh, both speed, water, pesticides. Uh, what it does to the soil, everything else, in terms of functionality, um, it you, it it is it feels, looks like, acts like plastic, um, and if we can produce it at the right price by using waste materials, then it's similar cost to um, to traditional plastic. And then on the disposal side, um, our products, I, I've actually been, um, we've been testing uh, our products, some of the, the various products in uh, dishwashers and industrial washing machines. They're actually reusable. Not only are they um, biodegradable but they're actually reusable um, they're reusable until that what makes them biodegrade is the soil not the water um, it's the microbes in the soil so um, as i say we've i've, I've uh, got items that we've um, we we've produced uh, that we've, we've we've washed in dishwashers over 50 times um, and they're as good as the first day they went in um, and equally as i say we've tested products for um, both uh, soil compostability and uh, industrial compostability, and that, yep. that's a pretty that's a pretty large moving feast. Our partners got a, a variety of products uh, that they're both using now, and we're using now, and we're testing new products and sort of new products with new applications. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of uh, almost endless possibilities there. Um, thanks for that, Kerry. Well, I think yeah, I think if, I mean if you, I, I guess if you think whether we look around your house, look around the office, look around wherever you are, and think what is made of plastic and you'll be surprised and you know you'll be surprised pretty much um you know a lot of items whether it's your phone case your phone itself the seat you're sitting on the desk you're at working at uh, the light that you um the light fitting um you've got uh the house fittings uh your shower curtains uh your bottles of detergents your bottles of shampoo most of your food products storage tupperware everything all, it's all plastic uh, and that all to some extent if it can, it needs to be replaced. Um, and therein lies the opportunity. So we're not worried about competitors. At this stage, we we could produce 100 times what we can produce right now. We wouldn't be scratching the surface. Yeah, yeah. And uh, just a heads up as well, we, we will go probably 10 minutes over time for everyone. I see uh, a lot of people have stuck around and we've still a lot of open questions. We won't get to all of them. I'll try and get to as many as possible. Um, there are opportunities for you to connect with the bi Botanic Bioplastics team directly as well um which i'd encourage you to do and then once the investment offer goes live uh, next tuesday there'll be a discussion board as well if you wanted to post any questions worth me saying we did have a couple of questions about um you know exit opportunities we've talked about uh listings on this call there's no way we can give timelines for that um due to to legal and compliance reasons but i, I do invite everyone to have a look at the offer document which is dis the disclosure document uh, comes out next Tuesday when the investment offer is live with all the financials and use of funds and market opportunity in there. And you'll be have be able to have a lot more detail uh, with that. Yeah, sorry, uh, two, two, two things to, to, to um, uh, add to what Martin has just said. Uh, first of all, by all means, uh, feel free to uh, call me directly. Um, I'm happy to answer any question. 
Um, there's also other members of my team who can help you if I can't answer all the questions. We've had a, a lot of questions over the last um, two weeks. Uh, we've had a significant number of expressions of interest, which have been very pleasing um, uh, in the many hundreds. Um, and uh, so that's pleasing. Uh, and in terms of, Martin's exactly right. Well, we can't give any sort of timelines on listing uh, uh, or even the, the likelihood of success for the listing. Um, as I said to you at the outset, my background as a corporate lawyer, uh, listing companies on the stock exchange. The reason I'm involved in this business is to list a company on the stock exchange. Um, so without putting timeframes on it, um, that is certainly our intention. Um, and uh, with the environment and the interest in ESG um, and sustainability and biodegradability and all the issues um, that uh, that sort of surround this sort of business, uh, I've got a very good uh, uh, friend who used to work for me who heads up now ESG for Moody's Rating Agency um, and in the US. And uh, the amount of uh, effort, time uh, that they're putting into the whole ESG area um, is incredibly significant. Um, companies are now being forced to report on their, their ESG compliance. Uh, company, uh, people who are producing products are being forced to uh, explain how they're going to migrate from you know, fuel, petroleum-based or, or fossil fuel-based materials to new materials. Um, so that, I think there's a, a, a sort of general tidal wave of interest in the, in the area. We're only one small part of it, um, but we're, we think we can be a, a significant small part of it um, and, uh, and expand um, as much as you know, funds, time, and and uh, and our team can can, can achieve. Yeah, absolutely. Really, a lot of attention on this industry at the moment, for sure. Um, I'll try and get to a few more questions now while we still have time. Uh, Bryce here has asked, Kerry, um, will other businesses be able to buy the pellets to do their own items, for instance? Um, that's a good question. Um, look, in the short term, we uh, we uh, would probably not sell the pellets to others. Um, Although, although we're sort of obviously wanting to help the environment and, and therefore we're, we're keen to encourage other people uh, to produce products, we obviously don't want to create some immediate competitors for ourselves. So at this stage, um, we would prefer to partner with those companies or people uh, on whatever basis. It could be a 50-50 joint venture or some sort of arrangement where we have some interest in what they're wanting to do. Now, as I said, to the, the people this morning wanting to talk about uh, reading glasses and doing that, um, we'd be more interested in in, in establishing a joint venture with them or some commercial relations with, relationship with them, we provide the resin and work with them to uh, to perfect the products, market the products, uh, or work with them to market the products rather than necessarily selling wholesale resin. Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, and probably better, especially with all those molds you're going to be uh, getting after this campaign to, to do it yourself. So well, that's, that's actually raised another issue. And the other issue is that there are a lot of, there's some work to be done on some of these molds, but there are, thousands and thousands of moles in existence um, that have been used for the production of traditional plastic products. With some modifications to the resin, uh, the viscosity, which is the liquidity of the resin, uh, and some minor modifications to the machinery and the moles, we can use existing machinery. So we're not constrained by having to buy new machines, which are very expensive, necessarily create new moles, although we will do that as well. So we've got our own, you know, additional designs and that sort of stuff. But we can use, um, and in various of our contract manufacturers, um, they have racks and racks of moles sitting there, which can be adapted. Uh, and with some changes to the resin and some changes, adaption to the machine, we can actually produce those products in bioplastic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, question here about... Uh, greater international expansion so we've spoken about the us obviously we're talking about australia here but in terms of you know uh, africa or europe um what might that look like have you put any thought into it uh, or is it uh in the longer term time no right? look, look we have but i mean and our initial um uh focus is on australia and new zealand uh, i guess new zealand to a lesser extent but to australia um and then we have to keep in mind um I, i've done extensive business over the last 20 years 25 years um I've had offices and operations in Hong Kong, Singapore, South America. Um, so I'm used to operating business in those places. Um, our, it's sort of be a, like a, a ripple approach. So we'll approach Australia first. Uh, we have spoken to, to um, companies already in uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Pacific Islands, um, in terms of joint ventures with, uh, with companies in those countries um, to uh, handle the marketing. So in other words, we'd, we'd handle the product and everything else and they would handle the, they'd have the relationships and the contacts and, and the marketing distribution in those countries. Um, but the market here in Australia, New Zealand and Southeast Asia, keep in mind, obviously 27 million people here, uh, six, 700 million people in Southeast Asia, 
uh, 3 billion people in wider Asia. Um, there's plenty of opportunities here that we can't even scratch the surface of um, without necessarily worrying about, you know, trying to operate in Europe at this stage. Uh, but yeah. Will we do it? Yes. Will we do it in America? Yes. But that's a bit further down the track. Yeah, massive market. I think the other thing, sorry, the other thing is, is quite relevant is that uh, where Australia is at with its uh, ESG uh, banning of various products, restrictions on um, on the use and, and, and proliferation of these products, we're, we're considerably, not necessarily ahead of where they are in Europe, but we're considerably ahead of where they are in the US. Uh, in the US, and I spent a lot of time in the US. Obviously, um, they've still got plastic straws, plastic cutlery. Uh, their straws and cutlery, they have, a, have laws over there that require the plastic cutlery to be wrapped in plastic. Um, and in plastic packets. So there, with, with a couple of exceptions in parts of California and Manhattan, basically the whole of America is still using plastic. So over there, if we were to sell products over there, uh, we actually would need to compete with plastic products that people can still use and they're relatively inexpensive. Um, over here, um, whether it's those products or any other products, uh, until we get to scale, uh, there's enough opportunity here and in Asia to, uh, Southeast Asia to uh, keep us going for the next three to five years um, at least. So do you see those like bans on single use plastics as being like key to, to your entry to the market uh, in those locations? Or, you know, like you said, in America, can you compete against plastic products? Well, it, it depends. That's a very good question. It depends upon um, how the regulations are rolled out. At the moment, um, it's very it's very patchy and very messy and the regulations are not necessarily that clear. Um, in some markets, there are like no restrictions. Um, in some markets, there are some restrictions. Um, but we would we just look at it on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis. What's the best opportunity? Have we got a good partner? We, we certainly don't go into countries, uh, you know, get off the plane and think we're going to establish operations there. We only would go into a into an arrangement, a commercial arrangement with people that someone in the organisation has an existing relationship with on, on whatever level uh, and where they've expressed an interest or, or relation, new relationships we establish. But we certainly only go into new, new jurisdictions with, with, with partners. Uh, and if you look at Southeast Asia, you're, you're talking about Indonesia, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, Vietnam. Um, you know, there, there's there's opportunities in all of those countries with a wide variety of rules. But the overall, over, overall and overwhelming uh, emphasis um, and uh, I guess um, intention on the one hand and movement on the other. Um, is to roll out bioplastic products to replace plastic products, um, and that 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 applies across the board. Uh, it does vary from state to, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, as I say, but yeah. but the overwhelming um, uh, emphasis in that regard. Recently, there was um, uh, I think there was, a, there was a, a conference or convention or whatever you call it in uh, in Paris last week that received a fair bit of publicity here um, about entering into a worldwide treaty, 170 nations um, to have staged banning of petroleum-based plastics. Uh, and the replacement of those plastics with uh, with biodegradable plastics, uh, and that's in 170 countries. So um, whether it's formal treaties, uh, government intention, um, private businesses or, or consumers wanting to adopt a more environmentally friendly stance, um, yeah, I guess there's, again, there's no real limit to what's achievable. Yeah, yeah, and it's really great to see some of those initiatives really taking hold. Um, okay, two more questions left. We've only got time for two more, so I'll, I'll kick off with one about threats, and then we'll finish on one about market expansion. So um, Kim here has asked, uh, what are the greatest impediments that you see will affect the success of this product? Um, and what are your greatest threats? Uh, again, uh, good, good, good question. Um, I think the first issue is, uh, and this has really already been achieved over the last couple of years in terms of people's attitude towards hemp. Hemp was considered a sort of bad product. Um, I remember even my parents, when I said I was going to, to get involved in uh, our medical cannabis business were, were horrified um, and yet now they see it and they use the products and everything else they they totally understand uh, so that's the first issue the second issue i think is the growing of enough material um, to uh, enable the um, appropriate expansion of bioplastics um, you don't want to necessarily be creating or growing crops just for bioplastics what you really want to do and a lot of companies doing doing a great job in this regard is actually using agricultural products that have been produced for something else um, using the waste material that's been produced for something else um, to produce bioplastics and that's exactly what we're doing so I wouldn't be going out and growing crops using water uh, using land agricultural land etc just to create fiber for bioplastics but because we're producing a product that already makes us money out of the crop that's why we can um, provide that material through to bioplastic bentonic bioplastics for free uh, and therefore produce an inexpensive product um, 
I think the only other issue is really explaining to uh, both government businesses and consumers um, the and, and demonstrating um, the quality of the products we can produce. Um, all the people we've shown our products to have been amazed. Um, we get X number of requests, you know, every week, every month, people just get samples. We send those samples. Um, and as I say, very rarely, I've been doing a lot of business over a lot of years. Very rarely do you get sort of universal acclamation that this is a great idea, great product. Um, and people are excited about the fact that uh, there are companies, not just us, but a range of companies doing stuff that, uh, you know, has, I mean, our, our intention is, is there's two ways you can approach this. Are we a not-for-profit environmental company that's producing products just to save the planet, but are losing money? Um, no, we're a, pro we're a company that's aiming to make money um, for our investors and, and for ourselves, but our investors, while at the same time doing something that's environmentally friendly and sustainable. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, all right, last question before we uh, wrap up. And thanks again for everyone who's stuck around and asked questions here. So Giuseppe has asked in terms of um, five-year plans, uh, what's on the agenda? Obviously, we can't go to too much specifics. Um, but yeah, do you have any ideas of um, you know what's top of the list? Well, it's, again, a good question. Five years a long time, uh, a long time out. Uh, we've been in this for um, you know probably started looking at it about two years ago. Um, uh, first products about a year ago. Um, the the more we look at it, the more I, I think I think the um, the speed with which um, people are going to move towards um, sustainability, environmentally friendly products. I'm not just talking about us. I'm talking about you know whether it's electric vehicles or wind and water power, solar panels, all that sort of thing. The, the rate at which um, that is being um, taken up or accepted or adopted, I think is gathering pace. So in terms of where we're going to be at, I mean, there are various countries that have got, um, including Australia, they've got mandated um, requirements, whether it's carbon neutral by 2030 or 2040, or, um, uh, you know, there, there are a variety of sort of arbitrary um, limits have been set. Uh, there are a variety of ways that um, governments are trying to get companies to achieve that. There's things like carbon credits and, and, um, and what they call ACUs and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think the speed with which people are going to start adopting more environmentally friendly products is going to speed up. And therefore, it's a bit harder to predict exactly what, you know, where we're going to be in a year, two years time. Uh, as I said, um, we, our plan is to um, build considerably on the, the, uh, the progress we've made to date. Um, hopefully following a successful um, CFS, CSF campaign with you guys. Uh, and once we've got to that, then we'll grow again and grow again. Um, as I say, listings, um, uh, you know, very clearly on the agenda, given my background uh, and given my intention with the company. Um, and that opens a whole bunch of new doors. There's, there's no, I, I could do meeting after meeting after meeting every day with people who've got some idea or opportunity. Uh, and we'd like, I think, as I mentioned to you this morning, Martin, we'd like to, almost throw the opportunity open to shareholders to say, look, if you've got a good idea uh, or if you've got a business that's in some way in shape or form involved in something that could be involved in bioplastics, we're more than happy to talk to you, look at it, uh, potentially, you know, create some sort of partnership, joint venture, commercial arrangement where we can work with you with our expertise to work with you with your expertise um, to get some of these products to market sooner. Yep. And that's, that's really one of the best opportunities you have with equity crowdfunding is not only being an investor, but also being part of the growth of the business. And with all the opportunities we've discussed in our botanic bioplastics, uh, there's uh, plenty of options there. So just wrapping up from my end before I, I chat to Kerry for one last word um, in terms of a bit of housekeeping. Next Tuesday, this investment offer will go live at 12 p.m. is the plan. Uh, like I said, if you've registered for your expression of interest, you have exclusive access to this opportunity before it goes live to the public. Uh, we do regularly see opportunities uh, sell out before that happens. So make sure if you haven't done so that you sign up. And if you have, uh, I suggest putting a reminder in your calendar for 12 p.m. on Tuesday so you don't miss out and you can invest early um, and be part of this exciting opportunity. Uh, finally, Kerry, uh, just last words from you in terms of a pitch to investors. Why should they get involved with Botanic Bioplastics? And we've covered a lot of details, but uh, if you could give us the, the quick uh, footnotes, that would be great. Well, Martin, well, Martin, first of all, thanks for the opportunity today to talk to you. And, and thanks for everyone else who uh, uh, sitting around here in the dark in, well, I'm in Melbourne, but uh, sitting around the dark listening to listening to, to me rattle on. Um, I, th I think the, the most important thing to understand is we're a commercial enterprise first and foremost. We're here to make money uh, for investors, but at the same time, we're here to do what's right 
um, environmentally. And we think by doing what's right environmentally will be our best selling sales and marketing tool. If we're producing a product um, that people can see the merit of um, and understand the attributes and increasingly understand the attributes or the, 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 some of the benefits of hemp, um, strength, um, uh, environmental nature of it, et cetera, et cetera. We think that that story, uh, the environmental story will be the best selling story we've got. As I say, first and foremost, we're here to make money, um, get listed, pay dividends, everything else. But at the end of the day, we're also here um, to do what we can um, in our small way um, to uh, to create environmental products um, and then continue to expand uh, the range of environmental products going forward for the next three, four, five, ten years. Perfect. Thanks, Kerry. And thanks for your time and for, for choosing to work with Virtual on this um, on this investment raise. We're really proud to have you on the platform. And thanks everyone who stuck around and asked questions. We, sorry we didn't get to all of them. Got through 25 questions, so uh, we did our best. But as Kerry mentioned, there's opportunities for you to reach out to him directly, uh, to the team, and also when that discussion board is open next week for the offer. Lots of really great questions. Everyone's very engaged. So encourage you to keep chatting with the team. There's only essentially two weeks left to go in this investment offer before it closes. And, um, you know, who knows when there'll be another opportunity to invest. Um, so thanks again, everyone, for sticking around. Like I said, the recording will be made available tomorrow. Uh, and Kerry said uh, the uh, the presentation will also be made available. So look out for that. Um, but thanks again for joining us. And thanks, Kerry and the Botanic Bioplastics team. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Appreciate it. Cheers. Enjoy your evening. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye.